I'm going to be entitled The Avenger. Can you say that with me? The Avenger. The Avenger. Come on, say that one more time. The Avenger. The Avenger. And uh, so I, I believe that this uh, series is going to minister to you. We're going to be on it for several weeks. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss a week. And it's going to kind of be finishing up the summer at the movies, so to speak. And in August, we're going to start on another series called The Incredibles, following up The Avengers. How many of you seen the movie The Incredibles? Yeah, nothing like what you think. So don't even try to think out what I'm going to be preaching on, all right? You just got to show up to hear about it. Uh, but we're talking about The Avenger, not Avengers, but singular, The Avenger. One more time, say that with me, The Avenger. The Avenger. And my objective in this series is First, to help you to understand who the Avenger is, but also not just to understand the who, but to understand the purpose and the, and the mission of the Avenger in the earth. My hope is that you would come to know deeply how radical the love of God is towards you. I'm going to say that one more time, that you would come to know deeply how radical the love of God is towards you. Somebody say towards me. And once you understand the depth of his love towards you, that you will become empowered to release that same love to others. And if I can say this correctly, on the behalf of others, because when you release love to others, you're really, uh, if we say it correctly, you're really releasing the love of God on their behalf. On somebody else's behalf, just like we were ministering to the homeless yesterday and uh, God used me to be a blessing to Ken Trail. God used him to be a blessing to us. He was doing it on my behalf. I was doing it on his behalf. And so that's my objective today. And you will only be empowered to do that only as you allow God's love to help you to overcome the fear of death. Now, that may not make much sense to you right, right now, but if you hang around, it's going to make a whole lot of sense to you. Say, you got to overcome fear. What's the opposite of love? Fear. The Bible says the opposite of love is fear. You would think the opposite of love is hate, but the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. And when you're not operating in love, you're operating in fear. Yeah, yeah. So when you're operating outside of the love of God, when you when you you <laughs> uh, uh, you are cussing somebody out or you uh, and, and don't act like it ain't no folk in this room that do that. <laughs> or when you when you are when you are when you are acting out of character. Let me let me let me let me put it that way. Y'all can identify with that. Right. You act out of character. Somebody pull in front of you, you know, and you act out of character. And so you're not acting in the love of God. It's actually coming from a root of fear, a root of fear. And so we're going to deal with that throughout this series, because I believe the root of fear keeps us stuck. I believe the root of fear keeps us from becoming the fullness of our potential that God has created us to become. Y'all not saying nothing this morning. And so uh, I want to start out by giving some uh, startling stacks. Christianity, just, just follow, follow me just for about maybe five, ten minutes and let me lay a very quick foundation here. I saw some startling stats that Christianity has shown to be on the decline in the U.S., uh, just in the last 10, maybe 15 years, uh, Christianity has gone from uh, about 80% in the U.S. population to about 70%. And that's mainly driven by the decline in the mainline Protestant and Catholic denominations, according to Pew Research Center. But in spite of this trend, in spite of the decline, people are still looking for Big stories to inspire hope and to satisfy their personal quest for purpose and mission in the universe. You wonder why you go see uh, Marvel stories and people love to see Iron Man and people love to see the incredible hope because they inspire hope in us. It, it, it gives us a big story. It gives us a big character for us to put our hope into. Albeit fictional, 
albeit not real, but at least I can sit in this movie theater and imagine that yeah. that that there's somebody out there in the universe bigger than me yeah. who can I can put my hopes in. And so I believe that that's why we like going seeing Marvel movies and we go see movies like the Avengers Endgame. As a matter of fact, uh, I ain't ashamed to say it. I went to see it about three times. <laughs> Anybody went to see it multiple times? Oh, look at all those hands right there. And so it's something about those movies that inspire us. It's something about those movies that, that, that uh, motivate the inner hope in us. That, that there's something greater than evil out there. Yeah. there. There's something greater than darkness. And so these stories, they act as a modern day parable to parallel light versus darkness. Now, that's not what we're going to be talking about through this series. We're not necessarily going to be talking about necessarily just light versus darkness. We're going to be talking about love versus fear. But you can't talk about light versus darkness without talking about love versus fear. Because darkness brings with it fear. Matter of fact, being in the dark for some folk brings about with it fear. That's why, the first, that's why they put light switches right next to the door as you're walking in. Because the first thing you do, especially if it's at nighttime, first thing you do when you walk in a dark house is you look for the switch, right? Because I'm trying to get some security going on. And light brings security. Light helps me to see who's in there with me. Light helps me to know I'm the only one in here who's supposed to be in here. Yeah, yeah, light. Light versus dark. We don't like darkness because darkness brings about feelings of fear. These stories, these stories they underscored throughout their hyped up dramatic storylines. The revelation, get this, that the redemption of the world and its salvation from the total subjugation from evil and, and, and suffering and sacrifice comes only through the Christ-like voluntary suffering of Christ. The redemption of the world. Did you hear what I said? These movies show us that the redemption of the world comes through the Christ. Like if you look at the characters like Tony Starks, who played Iron Man uh, in, in Iron Man and also in the end game. Tony Starks. Oh, I hate it for y'all that hadn't watched it because I'm sure about to present a spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Tony Starks died. He died in end game. <laughs> Y'all just should have went and saw the movies. I mean, it's been out. It's been out six months. My goodness. Tony Starks died. Okay, go to the movie and act like you didn't even hear me say it, all right? All right. He died because these movies, we need a big story to portray that the only way you're going to overcome evil is through a Christ-like Giving of oneself for the freedom of others. And you see it all throughout these movies. You see it all throughout the Avengers. You see it all throughout the Marvel characters. You, you see it, uh, uh, Steve, Steve Rogers, who uh, played Captain America. Uh, you, you see it in Captain Marvel, the lady movie that just came out, the female Captain Marvel. And, and you see it all throughout that, that this was this sacrificial character who went as a lamb to the slaughter so that the rest of the world could be saved. And it's all playing off the message of the cross. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, listen, you don't have to go to a fictitious movie to be empowered with hope. I want to give you some hope through this series to let you know that we have a real character. His name is Jesus, Emmanuel. God is with us. Ain't nobody saying nothing up in here. He's with us right now in this room. He's sitting right next to you. You don't have to go to a big elaborate movie theater to be encouraged with hope. It's okay if you do, if you use those movies to inspire hope in you. But you can be inspired with just reading the story of how Jesus came and gave his life for you. It's a movie in this Bible right here. Somebody say it's a big story. Come on, say it's a big story. And so, so it is. The ethical lesson is clear. In the movie Avengers, 
is that the salvation of the world comes not through violent conquest of the world, but through a reenactment of the passion and the death of Christ Jesus. It's a clear lesson to us that this movie gives us. Scientists have even been recently exploring. Now, this blew my mind as I was researching this. They've recently been exploring how this very phenomenon is discernible even in nature. It's called biological altruism. Now, let me read from my notes because I don't want to get this wrong. And if biological altruism refers to the mysterious actions of animals and plant life or one's individual drive for survival or reproduction, which uh, is also normally the strongest biological force. And it, it's an influencing behavior. But if it's momentarily suspended and replaced by a drive to save other living things at the cost of one's own survival. That's where we get the word altruism. Because altruism is putting others before yourself. But if you go off Darwin's theory, Darwin's theory says it is natural in human beings to first seek for their own survival. It is natural in a human being not just to seek for their own survival, but if I seek for anybody else outside of myself, guess who the other uh, group uh, category of people is going to be? Your children. So what is this thing? that supersedes the biological makeup of a human being, that makes them concerned about the survival of others other than themselves. Let me give you a, a perfect example. If you have a monkey and a monkey cries out to the other monkeys, a cry of warning, warning the other monkeys that a predator is coming. The monkey does this at risk of exposing himself, thereby decreasing his chances of survival. Why does even a monkey whose brains are not as intelligent as yours, why and how does a monkey do this? I think it's the cross calling out to nature. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I said, I think it's the power of the message of the cross crying out to even nature, crying out not just to animals, but crying out to human beings that that even to the most selfish human beings. There there is there's a message. The power of the cross is crying out to us, saying you are to put others before yourself because Jesus put you before himself. And it is your grateful response, according to Scripture, to put somebody else before you. It is your grateful response to the love that God has loved you with. Somebody say, it's my only response to God. To love my neighbor is my response to God's love. To, To lift my hands in worship, yes, it's not the greatest response to God's love. To come to church is not the greatest response to God's love. To pray is not the greatest response to God's love. But to put love towards my neighbor, the Bible says, is the greatest response to the love of God for you. You ought to give God some praise for that. I know it's hard to clap on that because people get on your nerves sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you you don't always feel like loving somebody else. But I'm not talking about ordinary love. Hunt your neighbor and say, he's not talking about ordinary love. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Aliciana, I'm not talking about just love that I can love you with. Because, see, there's one thing to love somebody with human love, but human love runs out. Ah. Uh, human love fails. Somebody say, but the love of God. Come on, say, but the love of God. Never fails. 
You see, acting for the survival of others when it may cost you your own survival, it doesn't quite make sense to the human psyche. It doesn't make sense to the human mind. You know what I call that kind of love? Radical love. Somebody say it's radical love. I'm talking about love that don't make no sense. Love that, love that doesn't make any type of logical sense. It doesn't bring logic with it. The love of God cannot be understood through your logic. You, you got to understand that if you're going to approach God right. Because if you don't understand that, every time you do something that you thought displeased God, you're going to run away from God. Oh, I'm dealing with something. I can, I can sense I'm dealing with something. Is that as soon as you do something that you think Come on now. displeases God, it's going to make you run away from him. But you got to understand you're not dealing with an ordinary type of love. Let me talk to this side. I say you're not dealing with an ordinary type of love. You're dealing with a radical love. An extreme God. Who went through an extreme act and released extreme love on a cross. For somebody to hang naked on a cross before hundreds of people, that's radical. That's extreme. And for, some, and for somebody to do it for people that hadn't showed up on the scene yet, that's extreme. The Bible says there's one thing for you to love somebody who loves you back. But it's another thing to love somebody that hadn't even done nothing to warrant the love. Ooh. This is radical preaching right here. Somebody say radical love. Come on again. Say radical love. See, this begs the question then, movies like this could make you ask yourself, am I willing A big God so madly in love. I'm not going to put you in it because I don't want you to get upset with me for saying little old you. For being so madly in love with little old me. That's the question I want to get answered today. What would make a big God go through such radical extreme things so he can release love on my behalf. Watch this. This is going to really make you happy to such a jacked up, messed up, sinful person like me. I ain't talking about y'all. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about me. What would make him love me like he does? It's a radical love. It's the love of God. Somebody say the love of God. Before we get to the scripture, I do want to point out there are four types of love that the Bible talks about. And from, from the Greek, the Greek language talks about these four types of love. And I'm going, I'm going to go through them very, very quickly. It's called, number one, eros. Eros. Eros is where we get our word erotic. It's a sensual type love. Eros. It's the kind of love that a husband and wife has towards each other. Notice I said husband and wife. It's, it's the kind of love, it's, it's, it's sensual. It's, it's, it's the kind of love for bedroom type behavior. Right. And then you got 
Storge. Storge is a family type love. It's the love that I have for my children. It's the love that my wife has for her siblings. It's the love that make her get on a plane if she hears that something happened to her sister. She's getting on the plane in the next minute and she's going to see what happened. Storge. Say storge. And then you got phileo. Phileo uh, is where we get even our city in, in Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's, 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 it's a friendship type love. Uh, it's, it's, it's the love of a friend. It's the love that David and Jonathan had. The Bible says that uh, David and Jonathan had a love uh, of that which was closer than what even brothers had. And so it, it's, it's a friendship type love. And then, but this love, this radical love, say radical love. This radical love that I'm talking about, it's called agapeo love. Somebody say agapeo love. It's, it's, it's agape love. It is the God kind. Notice what I said. It's not the human kind. It's not, it's not the kind that your neighbor is going to exude towards you. It's the God kind of love. It's not the kind of love that makes me tell you I love you one day, but then you do something that upsets me five minutes from now, and then all of a sudden I don't love you anymore. That's, that's human love. No, God's love is long-suffering. God's love is unconditional. That means it comes without conditions. Somebody say the love of God. I want, to, I want them to put a PowerPoint up. I'm going to make a couple of points and then we're done. This PowerPoint, I, I, I don't want you to forget this. This is, this is critical. This is a nugget that I'm getting ready to drop on you. The reason, the reason it is so hard to understand God's radical love is because love is directly connected to value. Notice what I said. The reason it is so difficult to understand the love of God is because love is directly connected to value. You say, well, Pastor, why is that so difficult? The reason it's difficult for a human being is because most human beings don't see themselves the way that they should. Let me put it another way. Most human beings don't value themselves the way that they should. Yeah, And you know why we don't value ourselves the way that I should? The way that we should is because it has something to do with our existential surroundings. Yeah. It has something to do with not growing up, having been treated in a loving way. And so you, can, you, you, you begin to become what you behold around you. You become your environment. You start seeing yourself like your environment. You start, you, you live in a small house, therefore you don't value yourself. You, you drive a, a small car, therefore you don't, you don't value yourself. Or, or, or you may uh, work a certain type of job and you don't think that it's, it, it brings with it as much prestige as you desire to have. And that's how you value yourself. But that's not how God values you. Somebody say, I'm valuable. Oh, uh, see, everybody didn't say it. See, everybody didn't say it. Come on, say it. Say, I'm valuable. There you go. Come on, everybody say it. Say, I'm valuable. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost now. Say, 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 I'm valuable. Come on, say it again. I am valuable. Say it till the devil gets mad. Say, I'm valuable. Say it till demons start trembling. Say, I'm valuable. I'm valuable. I'm valuable. I'm valuable. I'm valuable. I'm valuable. I can't get away from that, y'all. I'm valuable. I said I'm valuable. I grew up in a single parent home. I'm valuable. I grew up not knowing my father, uh, barely knowing, knowing my father. My father wasn't really in my life like I wanted him in my life. He was an alcoholic. He was a drunk. My father even shot my mother in the head twice. But I'm valuable. I'm sharing my story because maybe you are devaluing yourself based on your story. But if you hear somebody else's story who's just as bad as your story and he's saying he's valuable, then you must, you must come to think, well, my value is not based. Woo! It's not based on my story. Say my value is not based on my story. 
I'm getting ready to close now, but your value is not based on your story. Who told you that lie? That has nothing to do with your value. The Bible says he looked beyond our faults. And he found our need. God determines my value. God determines my value. God determines my value. Your weight don't determine your value. Your height doesn't determine your value. Your money don't determine your value. I'm valuable. I dare you to help me preach to your neighbor and tell him I'm valuable. Come on, touch somebody else and say I'm valuable. Don't go in it, I'm valuable. I don't care what you and no other devil say. I'm valuable. Beloved, what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon me that he would call a wretch like me a son? He valued you. He valued you before you got a chance to do something good. What make you think doing something bad is going to devalue you in his eyes? If he valued you before you got a chance to do something good, what makes you think doing something bad devalue you? Your actions does not change your worth in the eyes of God. I'm hurting somebody. You, you thought I was going to say I'm helping somebody, but I'm hurting because somebody's hurting right now. You're hurting from a religious mindset because religion has got you so stuck in this mindset that I got to do something to make God love me. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. You don't have to do nothing for God to love you. He already loved you. When you showed up, he loved you. Can I really hurt him? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really hurt him. You can be in the LGBT community and he loves you. Yes, he does. You can be somewhere smoking reefer and he loves you. You can be somewhere getting high on Jim Bean and he loves you. He loves you. My God, help me preach this. He loves you. Who told you that lie? I tell you who told you that lie. The devil told you that lie. Religion told you that lie. And I come to get you unstuck. I come to get you unstuck. So you can start loving your family members. And stop pushing them away. And start drawing them and attracting them like Jesus did when he was in the earth. The only people Jesus repelled was religious folk. He only repelled Sadducees and Pharisees. But he didn't, he didn't repel sinners. He attracted them because they felt his love. They didn't feel his judgment. They felt his love. I ain't talking about human love. I know this is radical. It's a radical love. Say it. It's a radical love. Come on, come on. You just can't dibble and dabble in this kind of love. You got to be all the way in. It's a radical love. You can't play around with this kind of love. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It don't make sense. It's radical. It's radical love. Somebody says it's too radical. It's too radical. Next thing I want you to know is everyone has been created to love, to, to be loved. Everyone has been created to be loved. Why? Because you have been created, watch this, write this down if you're taking notes, with value. You've been created with value. <laughs> the Bible says... That we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. That means we've been created with intentionality. God put intention when he made us. 
God created a masterpiece when he made you. There are no others. Just, just, just try two people. Take fingerprints from two people out of billions of people. And you can do it with the, the, the three billion that are on the face of this earth. And you will not come up with two prints of the same kind. Because he created you with value. Not just to be valued. Yes, you were created to be valued. That's why you want to be valued. Because he created you to be valued. But the reason you want to be valued is because he created you with value. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. You know the reason you were created to be loved is because love created you. Lord, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home, y'all. Love made you. The Bible says that we have been created. As a matter of fact, go back to Genesis and let's listen to Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, hey, let's do something different today, boys. What y'all want to do? Let us make man, let's make him in our image. So how do you know? That ain't telling me I was made with love. Well, let's go right back, Aliciana, to 1 John chapter 4. We saw it 27 times, that word, 27 times in 1 John chapter 4. And at least four or five times we saw this phrase, God is love. So if you weren't created by love, then what were you created by? Because God is love. It's love.